1976 and we're in the home of Dr. and Mrs. Uh, Fred Redding Hood in Oklahoma City on uh, 300. Mrs. Uh, Fred Redding Hood. This is Penn Woods interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends. This is uh, December the 8th, 1976. And we're in the home of Dr. and Mrs. Uh, Fred Redding Hood in Oklahoma City on uh, 300 Northwest 19th Street. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the Hoods uh, have been in Oklahoma a, a long time. They, uh, uh, Dr. Hood is a uh, retired uh, medical doctor and we will be visiting with uh, both of them with Mrs. Hood first and then with Dr. Hood. Uh, Ms. Hood, to begin with, I want to get your, uh, uh, your maiden name. Also, I would like for you to begin by telling after that who your parents were, your mother's maiden name, her, her, your father's full name, and how they happened to come to the Oklahoma uh, Territory. My name was Virginia Ford. And I was born at Venita, Oklahoma, or Venita Indian Territory, rather, in 1905. My father came from Kentucky by way of a uh, school uh, superintendency in Mount Pleasant, Texas, uh, to Venita, Oklahoma, to be superintendent of schools there. Uh, his um, uh, college was Georgetown uh, College in Kentucky where he got his uh, A.B. and his master's degree. My mother's name was Demariah, name for a great-grandmother, Bird, B-Y-R-D. Her father had come here from Virginia as a very young man and uh, settled near Benita, Oklahoma, or really just uh, out of Fairland, Oklahoma. The, uh, uh, he married a Cherokee, uh, or rather a Shawnee uh, girl who was half French and half Shawnee. Her name was Julianne Ellick. They lived, uh, they moved to uh, near Venita at the time and uh, built a home there where they had uh, eight children, seven daughters and one son. My grandfather's name was Osmond Jackson Bird, and he was a uh, dentist, so that he was often called he was Dr. Bird. Um, I'm being assisted, incidentally, by Ms. Mary B. Robertson, she, uh, our associate director, and she may be uh, asking questions as we go along. Also, Dr. Hood is with us as we go along, and he may... Uh, uh, we invite him to interject any questions as as we go along. I wonder, Ms. Hood, if you recall to begin with any of the experiences that your mother or your father may have told you about their early life. Oh, yes, I do recall a great many things, of course. My father's stories were around Kentucky and the fact that uh, he went to, uh, uh, while in college, he would go home in the summer and put in tobacco crop, and this is the thing that helped send him through college. My uh, mother was sent to Baltimore, Maryland when she was eight years old to live with an aunt there and go to a girl's school. She came home occasionally in the summers, but didn't come home to stay until she was about 16 years old. So a great many of her stories are also about Baltimore, Maryland, where my father's, my grandfather's people lived. The uh, 
The things I think that I remember most about my mother's stories, of course, were of the beauty of the prairie, the uh, wildlife there, and the uh, wonderful times the children had with such a large family, of course, making their own fun and their own games uh, all through their young life. The uh, prairie was the most interesting uh, story that she had of the, of the prairie fires that would sweep across the country and the uh, uh, way that the neighbors, that people would come for miles around to help fight them because the smoke from the flames would be seen in all directions as the fire swept across the uh, prairie. It must have been a very awesome sight, and of course it took many uh, homes with it. The wildlife ran ahead of the flames, often screaming and crying, and it must have been a, a very spectacular thing. Often the men would set counter fires, back fires, to uh, uh, meet the other flames coming, and uh, uh, was one of the ways that they controlled the fire at that time, or burned areas uh, around their own homes to keep the flames from leaping uh, the yard there, into the yards. She has often told about the snowstorms in the uh, early days when there was very little to protect the homes from the blinding winds that could come with the snow. And I remember one story of the fact that uh, they heard the great, some great uh, thundering knocks on the house and went out to find that there were four quail. Well, there were seven of them there that day in the house. And a few minutes later, they heard the same sound and went out again, and the three more quail, just enough for a meal that night. The uh, stories of, of uh, the wagons that came through that part of the country, since my grandfather had settled there in the early 70s, it was a long time before the uh, run came, but at that time he would there would be settlers coming looking for homes, and they would of course seek a creek along which they could uh, uh, spend the night, get out and wash their clothes and things of that kind. And every evening after dinner, my grandfather would walk down to the creek uh, every evening that there was someone there that is, and interview the people that were there, talking to them, encouraging them, often uh, inviting them up to the house if there was someone that seemed likely, or a person that he took a fancy to, he might offer them uh, a house to build a house on some part of his land to help keep this uh, big ranch that he had uh, up. So many times, uh, my mother has said that these people would come to the house, uh, that there would be horsemen come through the country, and no one ever turned anyone away, as I understand it, in that day and time. So many people came and stayed within their home and would be get up the next morning and go on their way. And it was only at one time in the, all the history of my grandfather's uh, open house, as we often thought of it, that they were uh, had anything disagreeable happen. Two men rode in, and the next morning my mother's, uh, my grandmother's jewelry was gone, which was inherited jewelry, heavy gold jewelry. But... Uh, I don't know that she had too much to fuss about because she left it in a trunk in the guest room. Uh, the first summer that my father was in Oklahoma, he taught summer school at the Indian Seminary, female seminary at Tahlequah. My mother, who was a teacher also, was there taking some extra courses, and they met at Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Later in my life, uh, my father was to go back to Tahlequah as professor of mathematics, and then in 1919, I believe it was, he went as president of the university. There were lots of uh, interesting things about Tahlequah in those early days that they have told me, and uh, of course about the, one, uh, the Indian settlement that is a part of history now. Your father was president of uh, Northeastern then. Northeastern. Uh -huh. uh, Northeastern at first, of course, it was the, uh, at the time, it was the Indian Female Earlier Seminary the Indian Femin when he went there. And uh, it was quite popular with not just the Indian girls, but girls from all over this part of Oklahoma went there. 
Did, of you, did you know Dr. Wiley, who was, I believe, the first president after statehood? I don't know whether he did or not. I don't know whether Dr. Wiley yeah. was there when he came to, when he went to uh, Northeastern. Of course, at that time, it later, after being the Indian Female Seminary, it became a teacher's school and was a two-year course and was called a normal school. I remember that all over the state, I believe there were six or seven of them, I can't remember, and people were very critical of the first educational department and all for establishing so many schools. But at this time, I think they're all uh, well-filled. Uh, they all have heavy enrollment, and uh, there's a great deal of uh, uh, credit to be given to those early educators who saw the possibilities in years to come. My uh, a father and mother then, mother was teaching in Bonita schools, and so when they went back, the natural course of events, they uh, became interested in each other and were married then the following year. When, uh, to go back to the college, though, at Tahlequah, it was during my father's administration that the, all of the normal schools were turned into four-year college, became four-year colleges under, I believe, the uh, directorship of Mr. Robert Wilson, wasn't it, the early, one of the early educators, and uh, I believe Governor Robertson at the time was the governor. If you would, if you have anything you mm -hmm. would like. Uh, yes, the, uh, I was thinking in terms of your own experience, now, do you first, uh, what's the first area you remember? Was it Benita or was it... Uh, no, I think the first area I remember possibly was, has to do, and this sounds uh, maybe a little bit off of the historical part, mm -hmm. but it has to do with the trains. Yes. Good. Because every summer when my father's school was out, we went to Kentucky to visit my paternal grandparents. Riding on a train was uh, an event even then. Of course, there was none of the comfort that there is today. And since our annual trip came during the summer, I remember that, of course, the windows were wide open. The terrific breeze generated by the train brought smoke from the engine and often small cinders and cold dust back into the passenger coaches. For traveling, people wore only dark clothes, and even small children would have dark suits or dresses with dark bloomers and, and uh, black bloomers and black holes. My mother carried a bottle of disinfectant and a cloth to keep the window sills clean so that we could keep as fresh as possible. But even at the end of the day, I think we looked like we'd been possibly out in the uh, uh, dust. To a child, the vendors with their ma newspapers, magazines, and paper cones filled with fruit were the most exciting. And as they went up and down the aisles calling their wares, every mouth drooled and wanted to buy. At intervals, the train would stop to take on water, and usually most of the people would get out to stroll around and limber up after having been sitting for so long. Everyone knew about how long it would take the train to take in more coal or, and water, whatever they had stopped for, but no one ever got on the train until the whistle announced with, after several long blasts that it was time to board again. Conductors would be the same on, uh, would have the same run for many years, and it was like reading an old friend I remember with my father would see the same conductor year after year. In fact, he tried often to get on the, uh, uh, his days when he thought the, uh, that particular man would be on, or on the train. Lunch uh, brought baskets and shoeboxes out, just about mealtime. And there seemed to be a standard travel menu, I remember, of fried chicken, cake, and fruit anything that you can hand with your fingers. Each end of the coach furnished any needed liquid with a big water cooler there. Diners were available when your train took on a, uh, on a Pullman somewhere along the way before night. It depended upon which point at which you boarded the train, whether you uh, started your trip in a Pullman uh, or rode in a coach until the Pullman was put on. The view from the windows of the trains, it seemed to me, was quite different from that of the sealed-in coaches of today. The views were of either wooded land, meandering streams, pastoral scenes with horses and cows grazing, 
farmhouses showed in the distance, and often with smoke rising from their chimneys, because in that day no one had gas or anything of that kind when they were always cooking with uh, wood or coal. If you crossed a road or one ran beside the train, it would be of dirt with horse-drawn buggies and wagons followed by billowing dust. At crossings, men kept firm hold on the reins, and once in a while a horse would rear up at the puffing, noisy train, which brought protests of profanity from his driver. My very earliest memory was of a rather tragic, was a rather tragic one, and should have, by today's thinking, given me some kind of a complex. However, I suppose my parents, without benefit of psychology, gave me such assurance that I came through without any traumatic results. One cold February night, when the ground was covered with snow, our home burned completely. Something uh, awakened me, and lapping down at my bed from the ceiling above were great tongues of flame. My screams brought my parents running, and I was wrapped in a blanket and taken to a neighbor's across the street where the neighbor held me up to the window so I could watch the house burn. No water was available because everything was frozen, and neighbors rushed to help, saving everything that they could. Next to the north side of the house was a big snowbank, and in the excitement, someone threw my mother's Haviland china out the window. It landed in the snow with the plates side by side, and not one of them even chipped. Today I have that china, and it's still lovely and unmarred. Fires almost always resulted in total loss in those days. Fire hydrants were small, they were not close together, and they did not send out the tremendous stream. And as I stated, in the very cold weather, they were nearly always frozen. At that time, we were, where this happened, we were living in Tahlequah, and my uh, father, as I think I stated, was, was a professor at the normal school there. Later, after the burning of this house, we rented for a while and then built a home at the edge of town on uh, a hillside, or rather on the top of a hill. Our yard had been leveled, but the rest of the hill was untouched and was a thing of beauty. In the spring, anemones bloomed in profusion, and in the breeze looked like a waving sea of pale soft colors under flowering dogwood trees. Following these would come the wild roses of summer, big blue violets, dog tooth violets, may apples, and tiger lilies. Such a variety of beauty for a child to live in. In the fall, the great oaks turned to a deep red, and the walnuts and the hickory nuts turned yellow, and the sassafras was all the, uh, with all the colors in between of orange and red. Gathering nuts to store for the winter was a job for the children. Black walnuts were most desired for candy and cakes. They came in a shell, and then which was covered with a heavy green husk. The husk had to be beaten off, and a favorite method was to get on an old pair of shoes and tromp on them. One couldn't pick at the green husk because it uh, stained fingers of walnut brown. I don't know whether that's where the dye comes from or not, but it simply would not come off, and only time would wear it off. After tromping off the green husk, we left them there to dry until there was no longer any danger from the stain. The nuts were gathered and put in the cellar, and many evenings around the fire, my mother, father would bring in a big basket of nuts that he had cracked, and we would pick them out, and get ready particularly at Christmas time. Hickory nuts, too, were delicious, and they weren't the problem, since their husk was divided, burst open, and shed the nuts. I have spent many a happy hour picking out hickory nut meats and devouring them on the spot. At Tahlequah, there were so many springs right in the city limits, I think there were 200 and some, and the many people, uh, and many people had them on their property. For that was true, they would build spring houses over them, and milk and butter would be kept there, for the water was icy cold. Of course, ox boxes were in every home at that time. But the spring houses sort of appeal to a child, and I can remember visiting a friend and always going to her spring house because that was the most delightful place to be. The ice wagon, of course, was a pleasant thing, and the ice man was always generous with the small pieces of ice that he chopped from the 50 and 25 blocks of ice, whichever you ordered for your refrigerator. 
My father kept a cow, and every evening one of my jobs was to deliver a quart of milk at ten cents a quart to a neighbor across the way. There was no such thing as pasteurization, but people handled milk in the cleanest way possible, and I never knew of anyone getting sick. I do remember that when pasteurization did come in, not too many years ago, how many people wouldn't use it at first because it changed the flavor of the milk, they thought. Would you have thought of, and so the rest of it, I... Uh, in Tahlequah, there was a courthouse and the town square where the band played on holidays and people picnicked on the grounds. Tahlequah had been a well-developed city since mid-1800s uh, mid, and was more like an eastern town than any other place in the state. Many of the homes were large and had leaded glass window panes and beautiful doors which had been brought over land over the mountains from the east coast. The Illinois River was, of course, a favorite picnic ground. Sunday school picnics, the various classes at college, and uh, just friends got together for the day at uh, the Illinois River. I do remember that it was uh, a river so filled with flint. In fact, instead of a sand base like some rivers, it was uh, the bottom was covered with flint. And it was necessary to wear tennis shoes, so granted this, uh, the swimming was not the best in those days. There were many whirlpools in the river. It was really a very treacherous river, and uh, uh, whenever anyone uh, went for a picnic, they had to be accompanied by people who could <coughs> who could swim because the whirlpools would show up so unexpectedly. I mean, you would get into one so unexpectedly. What years did you live in Tahlequah? Well, the first time I lived there was fr from the time about 1904, I guess, to about 1914. Uh, uh, then we returned about 1919, mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> lived there until my uh, until I graduated from college, and my mother and father moved to Tulsa, and uh, then I married and moved here to Oklahoma City or to Norman, and then Oklahoma City. What are some of the early events that you remember that took place in that square? That square is still there, and all of those things are still mm -hmm. there. Well, uh, mostly I just remember crowds of people there, I think, with picnic baskets and things of that kind. It always seemed to be Fourth of July, although in my memory I know that many times we also went to the Illinois River the Fourth of July. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether we were had to pick and choose between it or not. Uh, one thing that has been... Uh, my father did a lot of the surveying at Tahlequah and a good many of his maps up until uh, there was some destruction there uh, were still in the maps of the city and the the uh, uh, water system were still there in the old courthouse there at Tahlequah. He was a surveyor as well as a teacher and uh, as it seems to me that so many men who came to the country early were surveyors. He also laid out the early water system of Edmond, Oklahoma, the, that system there. Of course, that's long since outgrown the bounds. The, uh, uh, was, was anyone living in the Merrill home when you were there? No, not at the time that I was there. We used to, it was boarded up, and we used to go down there and peep in the windows and, and try to, in the cracks and so forth, and try to see what we could see. But, uh, it was later on that, that, that someone bought it and, and uh, uh, put it back in shape that it was originally, or probably even finer. But it was always a house that we understood was a, had been a house that had been very proud of there. We, uh, some of the people that we were very fond of there were the uh, Ross family, and they were the descendants of the Chief John Ross that came to from... Uh, North Carolina, Georgia, and all, with the, as possibly you know, Chief John Ross was part Scotch. In fact, he was more Scotch than he was Cherokee. He was, um, uh, uh, so many of the Cherokees in that early, uh, in the eastern part of the country, had intermarried with the Scotch fur hunters that came there and settled along that part of the country. 
So a great many of the Cherokees that came here were uh, part Scotch and I suppose some English blood, but uh, many of them had been well trained and educated, and so I think that's why Tahlequah was such an outstanding city, such an unusual city for uh, uh, the period of time in which uh, I remember it. Um, I do remember that nearly everyone there was a cousin of some kind way down the line, and that you were very careful of your remarks because you might <laughs> be uh, mentioning one cousin to another without knowing it. We, uh, I know that my mother would not allow me to go to school uh, to uh, a town on Saturday. Saturday was a day when everyone from the country came in and uh, the Indians sometimes, uh, well, we had some shootings there occasionally on Saturdays, so children just didn't go to town. But uh, in most ways, uh, Tahlequah was a very fine town, and uh, most of the things that happened there of that nature were things that uh, were sort of from old feuds among groups of people. Did you ever see any shootings? No, I never did. Uh, do you recall any specific fruit, uh, feuds that might be worth mentioning? Uh, no, this was something that uh, my mother and father were very careful. They didn't believe in children. All I was told was that I just didn't go to town on Saturday. But I do remember one time when my mother and I had gone to uh, Fairland to visit my grandfather Bird that uh, um, Belle Starr and her group came through the town and uh, got in a shooting fray of some kind just at the bottom of the hill at the back of our house. And when I got home, there was quite a bit of excitement there because some of the bullets had lodged in the house. <laughs> but that's just as near as I got to any uh, thing you of that kind. You never did see Bell Star. I never did see Bell Star. Did you witness any Indian events or festivals or any of uh, Tahlequah was not the same type of town that you find at Anadarko where the Indians came in. You see, most of these Indians, except for possibly their coloring, you would not have known that they were Indians. Uh, the five civilized tribes were very, were not given to, uh, well, I say five civilized tribes. The only one I really know about was the uh, uh, Cherokee tribe. I am a member of the Cherokee Nation. And my mother was a, I said Shawnee by mistake a while ago, my mother was a Shawnee, but the Shawnees went in with the Cherokees. Mm -hmm. And so I came along as a too late baby. And uh, I don't ever remember studying too late babies in history, but my husband tells me that that's one of the things that most interested him in history were these too late babies that came along and the roles were opened again. And uh, I was, uh, on the rolls and allotted out of Fairland and Afton, Oklahoma. The, uh, who were some of the early leaders that you recall in Tahlequah in the early period? Well, let's see. Of course, uh, Mr. Jim Thompson was the man there who had the, uh, who had the theater and quite a bit of business there. And he was one of the descendants of some of the Thompsons that had come in the early days. Then, uh, let's see, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Crew was the druggist there. I think he was an Indian man, too. Uh, so many of the Adairs were there. And uh, then uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Lawrence, who had a general store, and his family were all uh, Indians but uh, not uh, in any way that you could tell it, except uh, maybe coloring. I mean by that, that uh, they, all of these people had so much white blood that uh, it was not uh, easy to see that they were Indians unless you happened to know it. And uh, of course the staplers, which you would find possibly on many of your uh, uh, written up in any of the annals of Tahlequah were there. And uh, I wish I could think of them. I might find a little book that would refresh my mind. 
Who was the doctor from Muskogee who uh, who, who served it? Who served the uh, Cherokee <laughs> so much? Well, uh, there was a doctor fight. Is That's that right. who you're speaking That's of? Yes. F.B. Mm -hmm. Fight. Uh -huh. Tell us about him. Well, I didn't know Dr. Fight no. because I was younger. I did know uh, uh, his widow and, uh, well, I guess, no, I guess it was sister-in-law, and I knew some of the Fight boys. The ones, though, they lived at, uh, let's see, Halsell Fight, and several of them lived at uh, Muskogee. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know too, uh, they would come over to the affairs of Tahlequah, and I knew them casually in that way. And Mrs. Fight was also quite prominent, wasn't she? Yes, she was a very prominent woman there, and uh, she was a very definitely an Indian woman and, and well-versed and uh, uh, well-educated woman, and she took quite a part in the Indian affairs. Let me. At this point, we have uh, Dr. Hood joining Ms. Hood, so we will be uh, we're talking with one and then the other at some, at some points. Uh, I wonder, Ms. Hood, if you might tell us about uh, any, anything you recall uh, as you were attending school. I presume you attended your elementary school in Tahlequah, is that right? Oh, yes. Uh, why don't you tell about schools in Tahlequah, some of the events that took place in school, some of the highlights as you recall there? Well, at first I went to what was called the Old Mission School, which had been a Presbyterian, I believe, mission. And uh, on the grounds of the school were a number of little graves of children who had been buried there in early days and whose parents had gone on to other uh, parts of the state or other parts of the country. Uh, for little tiny children, we always liked to pick clover chains and pick clovers rather than make clover chains and things like that to decorate those little graves. I uh, don't remember too much. It was just a great big square building. I think it is still standing there. I don't know whether it's used as a school any longer. Then later on, I went to the uh, training school, they called it, at Tahlequah, which is where the uh, student teachers got most of their experience working on us. There would be two grades to a room, and... Uh, it was connected there at the with the normal uh, college, with the uh, normal school, rather. The student teachers, of course, uh, did their special work in different subjects as math and English and history and so forth. But uh, it was not anything too exciting, as I remember, too different, except that we did have uh, a great deal of memory work to do and I remember that most of our teachers uh, demanded that we learn long poems from memory, and we had to get up and recite them, and those poems have stayed with me to today. I think I uh, got a very real appreciation of English literature probably from the poetry that I had to learn. What was the uh, highlight, what was the most exciting event when you were attending uh, your elementary school there? The most exciting events, I think, were the May Day programs. We had, uh, uh, I think, nearly all the schools over Oklahoma, as I remember then, talking to other people, always celebrated May Day. It was quite an event. And being uh, with uh, dances with around the Maypole and so forth and so on, and special costumes that we made out of crepe paper. And being uh, uh, born on the first day of May, I always took it as a very personal party and enjoyed it thoroughly. Now, I believe that the Baptist Mission School that later became Bacon College was uh, uh, located in uh, Tahlequah, too. Was that, uh, do you recall that, or had it moved before you were there? Uh, that had moved before I was there. You know what happened to the buildings? Were they still there? Of course, this uh, school that we call the Old Mission could have been that that school. So there were so many Presbyterian missions around through the state of Oklahoma that I, I guess I just assumed it could have been the Old Baptist Mission. Well, I believe the male and female seminary were Presbyterian. Isn't that correct? Weren't uh, they? Uh, I don't know you that don't they know. were. Uh, they were built by the Indians themselves. Yes. Uh -huh. But whether it was uh, through with Presbyterian influence or not, I don't they know. They were seminaries. You know, yes, there were seminaries. Uh -huh. the, uh, uh, 
do you recall uh, any events that took place in the community outside of school that were uh, per that, that are memorable to you? Uh, no, except for the things that I've mentioned, like Fourth of July picnics and so forth, because the school uh, brought in uh, the life of the town, <coughs> as is always true with any school town, uh, was a great deal, great often, I mean, very often around the school itself. And we had very fine people brought in to speak, such as Miss Elman, Arthur Middleton to sing, uh, Miss Elman, of course, the violin, and uh, people of that kind. So the town people took part in that. The, uh, what about the lifestyles? Do you recall uh, the, uh, oh, some of the things that might reflect the lifestyles of, of that time, either the uh, styles of living or, your, or how you did certain things? That, uh, do you think of the, does that remind you of anything that might be worth mentioning? Oh, uh, the, the, of course, social life was very, I mean, there was quite a social life there in Tahlequah. Tell about it a little. Uh, I just remember the ladies' clubs and things like that that my mother belonged to. And, uh, of course, I was too young to take part in any of that. But there were study clubs, usually, or, or something of that kind. There were nearly always clubs for improvement. And... Uh, I uh, I don't remember particularly uh, families I do know and this is true I think of all people at that time there was a great deal of visiting among families in the evenings and Sundays instead of uh, the uh, uh, we didn't have to get together for for any dinners or anything people just dropped over and we had very often a an evening of music because Victrolas had come in and people were quite interested in lovely records and things of that kind. And uh, uh, I remember, of course, that many times students came to our homes, our home. My father had a great many students around. He ha also had a telescope, and so they often came to look at the stars and so forth. I'd, the I'd like to. Sure. I so oh, I, uh, I think we'll sw switch now and we'll visit with Dr. Hood and we'll talk with you about your earliest period and we'll, uh, uh, we'll go up when we kind of when we get to the period after you were married, we'll kind of switch it back and forth a little bit to, uh, uh, but uh, Dr. Hood, I wonder if you would tell us uh, who your parents were. Now you're F. Redding and that's Fred Redding and that's Fred, Fred. Frederick, F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K-R-E-D-D-I-N-G, -E 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 Hood, H-O-O-D. Now, I wonder if you could tell us who your parents were, your father's name, your mother's maiden name, and how, where they came from and how they happened to get to the Oklahoma Territory. Well, it's a very short story. All right. Uh, I uh, mother was born in uh, Alabama, and my father in uh, Georgia. And uh, in the early days, two families moved to northeast Texas, and uh, a little town called Omaha, north northeast Texas. And that's where my mother and father met each other. Their names were? Uh, Mother was Nora Robinson, R O B I N S O N. And father was James Claude Hood. And uh, they met in Omaha, Nebraska, and uh, Oklahoma, Omaha, Texas. And uh, they <coughs> lived there, and the, uh, while they were living there, my older sister and two older brothers arrived on the scene. Then they moved to West Oklahoma, Beckham County, a little town called Delhi. And uh, 1900 in Delhi is when I arrived on the scene. And uh, then when uh, I was about four and a half, five years old, we went to Cheyenne. We lived in Cheyenne for about a year and a half. That's where I started school. 
we move back to to, uh, to uh, Eric, and uh, then uh, we lived Eric most of the time since that time. Oh, Fred, tell them about your uh, experiences in in Cheyenne because I think they were very interesting. <laughs> well, it's. Uh, I don't know if it's interesting to anybody else or not, but uh, of course there are a lot of Indians in uh, Cheyenne. And uh, we lived up on a hill in the town, across the street from the school, and for about two blocks below us was a vacant uh, lot, and then below that was the, uh, the business part of town. And then that space between our house and the uh, business area was where the Indians and people from the country came in and their wagons and parked them on weekends and so that it the fact of the matter is that space completely filled up on usually Friday night and Saturday. And uh, so we had a lot of uh, interest going around us, particularly with the Indians. And uh, in west of town there was a quite a group of Indians. We had some friends out there who were Indians, and uh, one of the experiences that I've had in back in those days, I don't think anybody else would be interested in me, but uh, we went out to see these friends, and uh, as I remember, the uh, husband was not Indian, but the wife was, <laughs> and they, the youngsters looked all like, pretty almost like full-blooded Indians that I played with out there. During a time when I, I had on a, let's see, I was about four and a half years old at the time, had on a red suit, one of those funny little suits that little boys wore in those days. And I waited, uh, got out of the house and got down toward the barn and uh, turned old uh, turkey, got there took after me. And I climbed up in the wagon. I spent my entire afternoon before they missed me <laughs> staying up in the wagon trying to get away from this turkey. So it, uh, it's an afternoon I well remember. But, uh, we lived there and then uh, I think it's interesting where you went up on the hill you boys and watched the parade. Oh, yeah. well, the the uh, School, but when school was out in the afternoon, there was about five or six of us now. This uh, were just very small boys, five and six years old. We used to slip around town to the other side of town from the school. There was a big hill, and around the bottom of this hill came a road that came from the fork where either Elk City or Clinton, and all the traffic in that area came down that road. We boys used to climb up there and lie down so we could just barely see over the top of that hill. We call it a mountain, but it's just a hill, of course. And watch the traffic come in there. So we had a lot of fun out of it. Now tell them who came in, though. The big surreys and, and the freight wagons. Freight wagons, awesome. freight wagons and so forth. And so How would you describe the freight wagons? Well, they uh, were just uh, wagons that were pulled usually by four or six horses, most of them six horses. Well, oxen, you said. Oxen, I, I don't mean, mean oxen, uh, horses, Very oxen. Good. Oxen. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to think of the name of uh, Jess Willard, I believe it's the huh? driver. Jess Willard? Yeah, that's right. Uh, one of the drivers, one of those wagons from uh, between Clinton and Elk City and Cheyenne was this guy who was pretty prominent in activity was? Jess Willard. Jess Willard. Right. Jess Willard was one the of the boxers. Yeah. He and came on to Oklahoma City. Or he finally came, came into Oklahoma City. But uh, we knew him out there at Cheyenne. And he was a, quite a big husky guy. You know, you always remember him. Was he boxing then professionally? No. He, no, was he, he was just driving a freight wagon between the. Uh, Oak City and, and Cheyenne. Now he beat Dempsey, didn't he? That's right. That's the guy. Mm -hmm. In those days, he was just a youngster. And, uh, 
course, I was five at the time, and I expect he was what, around 17, 18 maybe. But, uh, that's, that's where he lived, and that's where I knew him in those days. Tell us more about Jeff Weather. Do you recall anything you may remember? I don't about recall him. very much about it. I don't remember. And, uh, of course, this uh, area, a two block area between where we lived on top of the hill, across from the school, and the main part of the business district down the hill, that's uh, where all, most of these things took place. And uh, we get used to go down, of course, and slip around and see this and that and the other. So we saw a lot that uh, we weren't supposed to see, I guess. But uh, uh, let me remind you, Fred. Uh, you mentioned the other day that any passion that they had these great big about four seated. We can't think of the name of it, but they were like surreys. You know that people. Yeah. Hacks, that's Hacks. what they called them, Hacks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that's, uh, and they came from... Mm -hmm. course, they met the train sometimes. Mm -hmm. Cheyenne was an inland city, and most of the uh, traffic was either between uh, there and Elk City or there in Clinton. And uh, people coming in the town came in these big hacks, four-seated uh, buggies, I called them. <laughs> and uh, either, they either from Clinton or... Cheyenne, so we uh, we were pretty well connected with the rest of the world, even if we were out in the wilderness. And uh, let's see, uh, then we moved from Lawton from there to Lawton, and and Lawton was a very interesting thing to me because of uh, Geronimo. You've heard of Geronimo. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Geronimo was. Uh, for a while, when we were down there, was loose going around where we wanted to. We used to see him quite frequently. We'd go out to Fort Sill. He'd be at sometimes out there. Then when they put him in jail, they put him in a, a jail there to, on Fort Sill. And on Sunday, I don't know why, and none of the rest of my family, but I always wanted to go see him. And my father would take me out in the buggy, horse and buggy. I'd stop and blow his window. And after you were there a few minutes, well, I, he'd come to a window and just stand there. And as long as you stood down below and looked up at him, he'd stand there. So that I used to go out there and watch him. And, uh, that was quite a... Those were the big points. It's about what year was that? Nineteen four, nineteen five. And, uh, I think he, he was there. Uh, he was there in nineteen four, but I don't think he was in the locked up until nineteen five sometime, if I remember. Of course, being five years old at that time, he be, be off a little bit. He later came to Del Mar Garden and became quite an attraction there, I believe. That's right. He was in and out. Yeah, he a was lot of places. He was uh, loose, uh, you may say loose, he was free in that area for quite a while. And we'd see him downtown. See him. Uh, we lived about two blocks, three blocks from downtown. And At times he sold autographs for a dime, did he? Uh, did he? Was he selling autographs any time you... Not to my knowledge. He always had something to say. I didn't... Uh, but uh, oh, we used to see him down on the street there, very, very frequent. My father was a lawyer in an office downtown. And uh, he knew that I was interested in the Indians, and particularly this one. So he'd go out of his way when he was downtown to see that I could see him. And uh, then when he was in jail, traveling a great deal, but on come in Saturday afternoon, he always took me Sunday afternoon. I go down and we stand below the window. He was in the second floor of this thing. And he wouldn't be there but just a few minutes till he'd come stand in the window. He hardly moved. As long as you stood out there and watched him, he'd stand there. 
and uh, it was quite interesting to me. Did you all go? To, did you go to Erie? We moved back to Erie. Well, we lived in Erie, then to Cheyenne, and then moved to Lawton. You were fairly close to Mangum, then, weren't you? About forty miles. Who was the doctor who was uh, mayor of Mangum for so long and organized the hospital down there? Should know, right you know him at all. Yeah, right on Tim McTum. I can't you know him. I, for some reason or other, I, the name slips me. He seemed to be kind of the leader of that area. Yes, he's uh, the one who stayed after I had graduated in pharmacy. Mm -hmm. I went down to Mangalore in the summer and took over a drugstore for a friend of mine. I ran it for him in the summertime, and he, uh, so I got well acquainted with him. School in Cheyenne, and then moved to Lawton in second grade, and went back to Erie, and spent the rest of my days up through high school in at Erie. You were telling me that uh, when you moved to Erie from Lawton, that you remembered that the city was a city of dirt roads all the way through, with one board sidewalk going down the main part of the city, and uh, paths made by human feet. <laughs> leading to all the various streets in the city. Well, that's right, dear. Uh, when we moved back to, to Erica from uh, Lawton, the uh, one block, this is the, the business district consisted of one block, and only one side of the street. And uh, it was a board walk, cracks about that wide, all between the boards, you know. and. Uh, it was elevated about, to, oh, I'd say, two or th two and a half feet off the ground. And uh, that was when we first moved back here. And uh, we moved to Lawton and came back next time. Why, it had changed a great deal again. You were telling about uh, the lighting for loud, you know, that you had in the city because there was no uh, electricity, of course, at that time. Do you remember about telling me about the lighting with the coal oil lamps? Oh, there's coal oil lamps out everywhere, yes. <laughs> We've got a one to go. When <coughs> back about that time, I got old enough to be a sorry jerker in a drugstore. Brother was a pharmacist. We'd go home at night, it'd be just dark, pitch dark, you know. No lights, no tree street lights or anything at that time. A lot of times, uh, People that have lanterns out on the front of their house or here and there. It's a nice light, moonlight night, fine, but if it's dark, why well, it's pretty rough. I remember you telling about the, uh, uh, of course, lighting by the coal oil lamps and candles, and that coal was used for cooking and heating, too. That's right. And that the big pot bellied stoves were the main furnace of the house, while the uh, Cook stoves took care of their part of the house. Well, in the kitchen, you cook stove warmed the house for you, and the, our house was just a two room house. And one room was a kitchen, and the cook stove heated that in the wintertime. We had, uh, I was the third boy in the family. We had, uh, at that time, one sister. Mother and sister stayed in one room, we had one room, the so called living room. And the three boys of us had uh, 
our beds in the kitchen. So one side of the kitchen was had two beds in it. And so it was a little two-room house at that time. It served purpose for all five of us. I lost my father when I was pregnant. By the time we were married, your mother had added a long wing to the back, which yeah. was a dining room and, and kitchen. Kitchen and another, another and bedroom. For that time, a type of bath, you know. And another bedroom. Another bedroom. Yeah. What were some of the chores that you performed during this period that you tell us how you did them? Some of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. It, uh, I don't know just exactly what area I'm, I'm getting into, but uh, when uh, I grew up, and we'll say in the seventh, eighth grade area, as far as school's concerned, uh, my uh, two brothers had finished school, and one was working in the lawyer's office at Sarah, and the other one was uh, the pharmacist and running a drugstore there in Eric at that time, and. Uh, I was a flunky. I was a sorty jerker. Before get up in the morning, before uh, school, go down and open up the store and get everything lined up, cleaned up around the sorty fountain. By that time, my brother came in and took over, and it was my time to go to school. And in the evening, and school was out, I, I went back to the drugstore and worked in the drugstore till supper time. He and I'd get out and have supper somewhere, maybe go home, and then he went back and worked till 10 o'clock, and I went back and worked till about 9. So that was the kind of a life I had during those years. How did you jerk a soda at that, that, those times? How did you mix a soda? <coughs> we had a, a back in the behind the, in the uh, store, we had these great big tanks of oxygen. And uh, they're about so big and about so high, you know. And we could hook two of them up at a time to a, a uh, apparatus we had back there. And then this w pipe led up to the soda fountain. And uh, mixed, it was mixed at the soda fountain with the water, so it give you carbonated water. Was that oxygen or carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, it, it, that was mixed at the fountain, mm -hmm. so that uh, then uh, all we had to do is pull a lever mm -hmm. down, and we got carbonated water. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about your ice cream? Was it, what farm was it at that time? The ice cream, uh, in, in those days, the ice cream was made there. We made it up ourselves, froze it, made it, and froze it. Later on, my, we began to be able to buy ice cream. First, we went over to Sayre and bought it. Huh? And Sayre, we, we bought some ice cream at 10. But for, for several years, after while I was a, a soda jerker there at the drugstore, why, we made our own. Right, yeah. I think they'd be interested in you know, talk about your chores, about the fact that, uh, about the butchering and. Uh, what, the house? Things at, at home that you did, and also about yeah. the cellar, old cellars that everybody had there. Well, we had a, we had a cellar, and uh, it was a pretty good sized cellar, out from the house, or far enough away from the house, so my mother thought that if we had a storm, the uh, house wouldn't blow over on top of the door, and then the house had all the storms out there in that area came from the southwest, so the cellar, cellar was built southwest of the house, so if anything hit the house, it'd go, <laughs> it'd go away from the storm cellar, and not, uh, and uh, it was a pretty good sized storm cellar. She uh, put a lot of fruit and food and stuff down there she wanted to keep. We had two double beds in the cellar, and, the, uh, and the, we had a pretty good sized family, and it's a uh, mother and my older sister, two older brothers, and a younger brother and younger sister. So we had a pretty good sized family. But uh, we could all crowd down into that cellar. And any time we had a bad storm, it looked like in the southwest, why, that's where our storms came from. 
Eric wasn't a very big town, I know, but uh, can you recall any exciting events that took place there? You were yeah. Of course, we had uh, each each uh, fall we had a a uh, group where you come in, cowboys and a rodeo and things of that sort. How don't you describe a rodeo of that period? Rodeo in that period, well, it's not much different as it is now. Uh, we had a, a big barn and a great big lot south and uh, east of town. And a barn big enough to hold a heck of a lot of cattle and so forth. And the lot was big enough that you could take a cow and turn it loose in there, and the cowboy would have plenty of room to chase it around, rope it, and tie it, throw it down tight. And uh, but uh, a great many of those things were taken really out in the country on a, on a nearby farm and where they had more room. To. But your rodeo is one of the annual things. Did a professional circuit come in? I mean, did rodeo people from over the country come in for? Uh... Well, we had uh, the Floyd boys, for instance, and we had another boy. I can't remember, I'm think of his name right now. That were nationally known cowboys that uh, went all over the United States. We had about five or six boys living within uh, an area of. I'd say 10 miles, very, who were really the big guys in all these rodeos uh, uh, out in Texas, and Kansas, and Nebraska, and all over that part of the country out there. So most of, most of the big boys were from Erie. Did you ever see Bill Pickett perform? Bill Pickett. The, uh, he was the black uh, bulldog. He invented bulldogging, and he came, he was in the 101 ranch base. No. Any of the 101 people ever come down? Yes, from up around uh, north Hawk part City. of Oak City, up in that area. He, a lot of those boys would come down to our to our rodeo in the, each fall. Do you recall where were you at the time of statehood in 1907? 1907, I was in Eric. In Eric. Yeah. But uh, did you have any? Celebration, big celebration in Erie at the time of the of statehood. Well, they uh, turned on a whistle that night. That's about all. They, uh, nothing particular. Uh, we we kind of had a state of our own out there. <laughs> there were several things on here that I thought were very interesting about. Uh, uh, going back to the cellars, because uh, uh, Dr. Hood was telling me that there, is, of course, none of them were of cement construction like they have been in years since, or like I remember them as a child. But they were uh, uh, wood construct. I mean, they were dug down into the earth, and then they were the uh, top of it was boarded over and then mounded with dirt. And he said that one of the things, he mentioned having some furniture down there and there's lamps and things, but one of the things they always kept was a shovel in case you did pick, have something pick, blow over on you. Picking a shovel. And yep. then uh, uh, also a hoe, I think you said. Yeah, pick shovel and a hoe, it was down there. And uh, of course the shovel was kept so that they could dig themselves out, but the hoe was kept because of snakes, because That's right. it happened to be a favorite place for snakes to gather also. And he was telling me the other day about uh, one day seeing his mother go down to get some canned fruit. And uh, that um, before <laughs> she came back out, a big black snake dropped at the doorway. Why don't door you tell about that? Wish you would tell about that. Question. Well, she, uh, uh, we heard her holler and started down. And she hollered not to come down. But you could see this snake looped over something up there, I don't know what, it was hanging down right over the door at the bottom of the stairs going down in the cellar. And he was just swinging back and forth and hissing. 
and uh, we kept a mother kept a hoe and a shovel and a pick down in the cellar just in case that uh, we had uh, had a storm and some blow a house or something over on top of the cellar door so we could dig her way out and uh, so she had equipment you know mother wasn't scared and she grabbed up a hole there in the back of the, uh, the cellar and she reached up and caught that snake caught, got it down on the floor and then when she got through she sent me down there to clean up the pieces. And the snake was about this long, brown snake, and she cut it up in pieces of that. He just picked up a whole one. This is a continuation of uh, the tape with uh, Dr. and Mrs. Hood. Uh, we're still talking with Dr. Hood. I wonder uh, if you can tell us some of the highlights of uh, school, some of the school events that took place, where you went to school, that's your elementary school, and some of the things that happened. I don't know much, very much to tell you about it. It's, uh, the, uh, the school and I was there. We had one school building, and everything from the kindergarten to the tenth or eleventh grade, how far ever they went uh, in those days, it was all in the same building. And uh, they, uh, of course, I started in there, and they had the first grade and third grade. You started. Huh? Third grade. Third grade. The third grade at Erie. I had the others elsewhere, the first grades elsewhere. And uh, so I don't know too much to tell you this would be of interest except that the, uh, well, I don't know. Were there any school events that took place, uh, like uh, athletic events or, uh, or uh, spelling bees or literary? Or they had spelling bees when I was growing up. And I took part in those. And then later on, uh, as I got older, I had athletic events. And uh, I never really did play baseball because in the spring I always had a job in a drugstore I had to do in the spring. In the wintertime, uh, my drugstore job was restricted a great deal, so I was able to play basketball and football uh, on the teams. And we had a p pretty good uh, teams, we had pretty good results. We had games with uh, Elk City, and Clinton, <coughs> Sayre, Mangum, Shamrock, Texas, McLean, Texas. Those were most of the teams that uh, were in our league, you might say. We didn't have a league, but those were the ones that we played nearly every year. And 
we held her held her own pretty well. I played basketball on the tennis team, played football, and uh, first year I played foot first time they ever had football out there. Uh, that fall we only had two games and uh, the, uh, the second game I was a center and they smacked me pretty hard and knocked me out and uh, I'd always amused it to my neighbors and friends out there my mother was there watching the game <laughs> and uh, they knocked me out standing over me somebody asking me aren't you going out there about to see about him and she says no I didn't give him permission to play and I'm not going to <laughs> he got her it's up to him now <laughs> so <coughs> mother wasn't very sympathetic with anybody got hurt playing football but uh, we had a pretty good football team we had uh, an excellent basketball team we won the county meet three years out of my four years in high school. So we had a pretty good basketball team. How did you travel between towns when you played? Well, uh, usually by car. And you, you were, you had car, you were driving by car today. That's right. The, uh, it's about 14 miles from here to Sarah, but in those days we had to go around with Del so it was 28 miles uh, to go to Sarah. Of course, now you can go straight through. We had uh, played Mangum and uh, Sayre and Elk City, and Shamrock, Texas, McLean, Texas, and uh, so we were. We had a pretty good territory up there for our athletics. They usually had a fight with the town boys after the game. Oh, I understand. Yeah, that's right. Well, that was, uh, Miss, do you think of anything else in this early period? We want to get uh, later into the, the uh, university and to the medical career, but uh, do you have any... Uh, oh, that Dr. Hood had yes, passed here. Yes, that he should. <coughs> well, I remember him <coughs> last night. We were putting down some things, and he uh, <laughs> might uh, turn this just a little this way. Uh, he, he went on to tell me that people were very... Uh, much dependent upon themselves for a variety in their diets. And consequently, everybody had their own, of course, vegetable gardens, as they still do in towns, and berry patches and fruit trees. And that if you had chickens or cow or pigs, you tried to raise as much feed as possible because it was hard to get and so forth. And uh, uh, Ms. Hood, uh, I remember you telling me that your mother had been widowed by that time and each of the six children had their jobs as they grew old enough to be capable. You know, like you said, yours was keeping the lantern full of oil. And they also worked before and after school. I know that Dr. Hood sold St. Louis Post-Dispatch and a number of things like that when he was very little. You were about, what, seven or eight when you started that, weren't you? St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Saturday Evening Post, Ladies' Home Journal, and Country Gentleman. <laughs> and Country Gentleman was the big paper, big one with a bunch. Well, and then I think he was telling me that in late fall, when the weather got very cold and it was butchering time, and the rendering of lard was one of your big jobs. That's right. A large iron kettle with uh, three legs, I think you said, was set out on bricks on the... Uh, uh, backyard. Backyard with a fire kept under it. And uh, that my some... My job to keep that fire going. And, and to I'll stir. Tell you, <laughs> and I tell you, you burn up your knees and your legs and your front. And the back end was just freeze out there in that cold air. So it, it was a very uncomfortable situation. And that same thing was true when you made soap, because yeah. people made their own soap in those days. Well, lye soap was made in that same That lye yeah. soap, uh huh. In the same pot we fixed the other. Uh, Dr. Hood was telling me that you always, I said, did you always have bricks out there to put the kettle on and he said well yes you had to have bricks because he said one time I put it on rocks when my mother was boiling her clothes and one of the rocks slipped and the pot turned over and he said I really from that day on I remembered to get bricks all the time <laughs> to make it even because I really uh, you really caught it you said from your mother and then you were telling about how hot the summers were out there and the fact that uh, 
uh, they were often so dry and that people just, uh, of course, people just simply put up with it because they, that was all they could do. Well, they put up, in those days, you didn't have uh, air conditioning and, and uh, in our house before the windows, the mother would uh, take and soak a net of some sort in water and then she'd have a tubs at the bottom of the window the tail end of this thing in the mm -hmm. water, so that it, the water would seep up to it, you right. see. Evaporation. Evaporation, that's right. I'd like to ask both of you, uh, uh, Dr. Hood and Mrs. Hood, when did you first see Oklahoma City? When I first saw Oklahoma City, I was brought down here on account of the condition in my eyes. In, uh, let's see, I was uh, 12 years old, 1912. 19. 1912. Why don't you describe Oklahoma City as it was when you saw it? Then I'm going to ask Mrs. Hood to tell me that. I'm supposed to do that. All right. It's just right and uh, then I'd like for you to tell when you first saw Oklahoma City and describe mm -hmm. it the streets, the buildings, the people, anything you can think of at the time. All right. Just right around that uh, hall in there, and you'll see it, I think. I don't know. Uh, Hardly how to describe it. Well, Fred, uh, uh, you came you came down because you uh, uh, doctor had stuck a knife in his eye when he was just a little child, playing mumble peg. Oh. And uh, fortunately, the country doctor out there was uh, a very sensible man, and he didn't try to do anything with it. Does he have that going? Mm -hmm. He didn't try to do anything with it, but just simply to protect it and heal the eye as it was. Then later on, he was sent down here when he was about 12 to Dr. E.S. Ferguson, and he took the train down from Eric, came by himself, and then tell about the friends that were to meet you. I'll hold it. Well, uh, the uh, couple that lived at Eric for a while met me and took me. Uh, they lived on 8th Street. I stayed with them two or three days as I had to be here, and then they took me down to town to the... Uh, Dr. Ferguson, Dr. E.S. Ferguson, who was the doctor who took care of me at that time. That was 1912, I believe, 1911, 1912. That, uh, because I was either 11 or 12 years old at the time. So, uh, well, there wasn't much, it wasn't much as I, uh, I believe you told me from, uh, 8th Street North, was there? Not very much. They lived, uh, I thought they lived pretty much out of the edge of town at the time. And uh, they were on 8th Street uh, between Hudson and, uh, uh, wasn't Hudson and Harvey, I guess it was too, wasn't it? Hudson and Harvey. And that was, that was pretty much out of town. Oh. I believe you said that you walked every place you went. You oh, know. yes, yes. We never did ride anywhere. Of course, we stayed out on 8th Street, and, and it wasn't much of a walk downtown, and it wasn't much this side of 8th Street to see. It wasn't much Oklahoma City north of 8th Street at that time. The uh, hospital, uh, St. Anthony Hospital was out there, that was about as far north as uh, there was anything in Oklahoma City at that time. It was kind of out of... The Concord well, House was probably there, I think, at that time, wasn't it? I don't but, remember. But they were out in the country, you know, supposedly. But that was like 1911, 1912. So he's grown quite a Did bit. Did you move to Oklahoma City at that time? No, I just came down just to see came him down, sorry. for medical treatment. I didn't come down to, uh, to live until, you know, 1918, while I was in the Army, I was in this area. Had it changed like everything when you came then? Oh, hadn't yeah. Changed to beat the van. And it's changed a lot since I was here in the Army, yeah. 1918, too. Yeah. It's yeah. changed a lot. That's uh, what about when you first saw Oklahoma City? When was that, Miss Hood? 
Well, my father was, uh, came to Edmond as professor of mathematics there at the college. And uh, my first memories, of course, are of an, about an hour's drive from Edmond to Oklahoma City over very dusty roads. And uh, I, to me, Oklahoma City was a big city. I had seen, uh, I'd been in St. Louis, but mainly just at the big Union Station there when I was a child and not out into the city. So Oklahoma City was probably as big a city as I had seen except Muskogee, <laughs> which I thought was quite large. Uh, we uh, came in from Tahlequah, I guess, on the Frisco Railroad when we moved here. And uh, then uh, the part of Oklahoma City, of course, that was the old Rock Island Station was still there and uh, that has now become the, where they've built their civic buildings. And uh, the, uh, uh, there were quite a few buildings down at that end of town. I don't remember. I did, to me, it was just a big city. I what do remember. was this? This was when I was 14, I guess. So that was about 1919, somewhere along in there. No, 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 I'm sorry. It was uh, earlier. I went back to Tahlequah when I was 19. It must have been about 1914 that we, that we moved to Edmond and would come back and forth. The uh, city at that time was, as I remember it, more of it was down at the end near the uh, depot. And uh, well, we Rock went- Island Depot was uh, right north of where the Skirvin Tower is. Yes. Skirvin Hotel is now. Yes. And then the uh, Huckins Hotel, of course, and the big Clawson Dinner Bell was where we loved to have our noon dinner. And uh, I don't remember, I don't know where, when it went away or when they, uh, but that was the big cafeteria, really, that we, uh, I don't remember too much about it at that time, except that I do remember St. Anthony because I had to have my tonsils out. and and uh, came up to St. Anthony to, to have that. St. Anthony at that time was the small center building that is no, no longer in existence at all, but it was the one that you will remember as being the, uh, having the big front that fronted on uh, Dewey, I guess it is, or Lee, which, no, it's Dewey that comes in there. And uh, it was surrounded by lilacs. It had a hedge of lilacs all around it, and uh, I remember what a beautiful thing it was. Then out at the side on the south were two great big porches, and that was the only, lots of the uh, nurses and different people in the hospital would go out there to try to get cooled off. But uh, the thing I remember most was the uh, lovely lilac hedge around that St. Anthony Hospital, and I don't think there's a sign of a lilac left there now. The hospital just about like that when mm -hmm. I started mm -hmm. medicine. I remember uh, a little bit later on shopping at several places like uh, uh, Brown's, and I shopped at Kerr's. Halliburton's was was here then, and it was called uh, Lloyd Halliburton then. Yes, I think it was called Lloyd Halliburton, and then the Bass Furniture Company mm -hmm. and Spivey Furniture. Some of those were were in when I was here as a child. How about Doc and Bill? Monroe. Yes, Doc and Bill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What? I don't remember that one. Which one? Oh, Petty's. Petty's. Petty's Hardware, Petty's Hardware. yes. Yeah. Petty's Hardware. Do you remember Mr. Petty, either of you? I do. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I just remember him at the store occasionally, but uh, my fr uh, friends knew him and pointed him out a time or two, but I never did know him. Do you remember Rolliter Hospital? Rolliter? Yes, I've been there many times. Have you? Yeah. Tell about its operation. I mean, it's uh, that the buildings are still there, about a third-rate uh, rooming house now, but tell about the operation of Rolliter Hospital, and tell about Dr. Rolliter if you remember him. I very remember him very, very little, actually. Uh, when I first came here and up in Norman, in the sport, for medicine standpoint, uh, I had some classes, medical classes, clinics, down at the Rolliter Hospital. And uh, of course, Rolliter was not there at that time. And uh, so I know the hospital, but I didn't know Rolliter. Mm -hmm. See, this was in 1928, 9, and 30, and along the way. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Rolliter was still operating there, yeah. the hospital. Mm -hmm. 
I went down to Norman in 1918, but I took pharmacy, taught pharmacy. Finally, got back in the thing I wanted to, uh, medicine. And uh, so that I had a period of a number of years delay in getting into the medical field. The, uh, why don't you tell about the university as you recalled it during the period of right after World War One? After World War One, well, the campus uh, was composed of the administration building, the two brown buildings. One was the educational building, and the other one was a uh, scientific building, which were next to the uh, administration building. The chemistry building on one side and law building on the other. The uh, engineering building, one building, the old building was there. And then the west side of the campus was the uh, Stiff House medical building where we kept all of our <laughs> work things we worked on over there. They called it the Stiff House? Stiff House. <laughs> and it is full of stiffs. <laughs> and. Uh, now that was just, uh, that was it. The uh, athletic uh, building was a frame building, uh, which wasn't very big. Just room for a basketball court, and that was it in those days. But that was, that was back in 1918. Well, when you attended medical school, was it down, wasn't it up here rather than down there? <coughs> the first two years, were down there, and then the uh, second two years were up here. Mm -hmm. And of course now it's all up here. But when I was there, I took the first two years down at Norman. Uh, I was on the faculty down there at the time, and uh, so I'd get out. I'd take my classes and I'd teach, set them up. I always set them up so it ended up from wouldn't interfere with the classes I was going to attend. <laughs> so uh, in those days, they were not st strict about uh, faculty taking hours. Mm -hmm. There was no no complaint from anybody. My, as long as my dean didn't complain, dean of pharmacy, I was teaching pharmacy. As long as he didn't complain, why well, nobody else would complain. Mm -hmm. And uh, wait just a minute, can you ask oh, a question? Oh, wait just a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the Dean of Pharmacy was interested in taking medicine, and he, uh, so he didn't complain about me taking medicine. Either. So I took, uh, worked out my first two years of medicine in what was four years, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, I was supposed to take uh, four hours, one course, uh, a semester. As a member, full member of the faculty, that's all I was permitted to take. So I took a course in anatomy. It was actually, it was a 10-hour course. But I enrolled for four hours credit. So as long as I was enrolling for four hours credit, I only got four hours credit for it. Nobody complained. So I took the course. As far as the medical school is concerned, it didn't, the hours didn't count. It just a course that counted. So I could take a, uh, the course, get four hours credit for it, and yet complete my medical requirements, you see, which is, I guess is the honest way to do it. <laughs> but, but I was able to take, uh, work out my first two years of medicine as a member of the faculty. Now, were you married at that time? Yes. Why don't we go uh, to you at the university and think of things that uh, Dr. Hood has not mentioned that you might tell us about. Yeah, things that he did. Yes, that, no things that you did. Oh, well, I, I don't know of anything so terribly exciting down there. I was a member of Cap Alpha Theta, and uh, we uh, were building a new house on Boulevard at that time, and that was quite an uh, quite an event because the houses so far had been rented by the different sororities and fraternities. Uh, some of the fraternities owned their homes, but the sororities didn't. And uh, so my work down there was 
uh, I had already attended uh, the school at Tahlequah for my uh, freshman and sophomore year. So uh, when I went to uh, Norman, I was already into the junior class. And uh, so I only had two years there, but uh, two very enjoyable years. And uh, it was small, the school was small, but by the time I got there, the law barn had been built and the library was there. And uh, I'm trying to think, oh yes, and the uh, athletic, or the women's building where the, y, where the YWCA, which was quite a prominent, uh, quite a activity for us then and uh, with uh, the swimming pool and all the women's gym. I uh, don't, and the fine arts building was there too. So that the buildings that have been built, is one, another building been built in between and a good many others, but they were not there at the time that I was there. It was a school, I suppose, of around 5,000 when I was there and uh, we knew, uh, you just knew everyone on the campus. It was very, uh, interesting school to be in because it wasn't, there was, everything was uh, so, uh, well you had so much more attention when your classes and things, the classes weren't as big, they were more or less limited and uh, you uh, got a great deal out of them. Oh yes, I remember that the geology building was there because that was one of my favorite subjects at the time. But the school, I believe, w the uh, uh, North Oval, I guess you would call it, was pretty well developed by the time I went down. But the uh, uh, south part of the campus had not developed. None of the dorms and all were there at that particular, uh, the dorms in the south. Let's see. Tell about some of the social events at the uh, university at that time, how uh, th they had all student events at that time, I believe. Yes. Tell about some of those. Well, the most fun event, I think, of all was the, were the Saturday night student council dances that they had. And uh, just everybody went, and I think that's where I really learned to dance, if I, if I did. <laughs> because the first uh, uh, dance there, I mean, the prominent dance at that time was called the toddle. And anybody that couldn't toddle <laughs> uh, couldn't dance, really, because it was just simply a sort of a hop from one foot to the other, if you remember it. And I, that was in a building downtown, an old frame building. And I can remember that when it was full and the dancing was going strong, that that floor would shake. and We could feel the building vibrate. But uh, all of us were courageous souls and never thought about anything happening at all. Then, of course, the uh, every month the fraternities had their dances, and it was quite a uh, an event and quite nice to be invited to one of them and they really went all out in decoration. The boys gave quite a bit of time to uh, going out of town even to get roses at certain times of the year and all to decorate their halls and the Christmas dances were perfectly lovely. Most of those were in what we call the uh, late of the building where the old teepee was. Now that's that was on the boulevard and I don't know whether it's much in use now or not and then the, uh, that dance hall, plus the dances in the houses, <coughs> plus the student councils, made up most of, <coughs> excuse me, made up most of our social life. Uh, we, we walked to the dances, or if they were downtown, we took the bus. Nobody had a car there in school, and uh, nobody thought anything at all about walking or, or taking a bus to a dance. Of course, when they were in the teepee, why, well, we all walked. Uh, the one of the, uh, the so to speak hangouts, I guess, was the teepee uh, below the soda fountain and all there, and the old varsity shop. Uh, we were on the varsity shop side. Yes, on the varsity shop where everybody congregated for coffee and and big sweet rolls, which they had, and which I haven't seen since the <laughs> school days. But uh, that was the favorite place to congregate. I remember that, of course, we had some literary clubs and things like that. I don't remember too much about them. I did belong to the Indian Club, and, and I was uh, active in the YWCA. Our uh, uh, sororities required that we have activities 
during the week and that we have a, a religious activity which meant going to church and that we have then we could have other activities you could also if you didn't make up your other activities such as the Y or uh, belonging to some or we even belong to political clubs or uh, the, as I say the Indian club and some of those things why you could uh, go to church twice a day and get your activities but you had to report two activities every week and one of them had to be religious. Dr. Hood, what about you? You were a member of Kappa Sigma of which I'm also a member and uh, why don't you uh, tell about uh, the Kappa Sigma fraternity at that time? Well, the Kappa Sigma fraternity uh, was on uh, uh, ASP. Huh? ASP, wasn't it? Do what? I didn't hear what you Asp. said. ASP. ASP, yes, ASP Avenue. Uh, the old Cap Sig houses faced the street between uh, Boulevard and ASP there, down about a block or so from the pa uh, south of the uh, campus. And uh, the, uh, well, the, ca the, uh, Well, they building up on the campus, uh, next to the campus there. It was uh, run by Cap Sig. So that was kind of Cap Sig hand the holdout in those days. Uh, and then uh, on, uh, on our street, there was a group of girls next to us. Uh, Next, next Gamma door. Phi Betas. Gamma Phi Betas. Street, I believe, and the Chi Omegas down the street. And the Chi Omegas were across the street from us. And then uh, the Acacia was up t toward the campus. Of course, our hangout, since it was owned by the Cap Sigs, uh, was the old varsity shop up there, you know. That was our chief hangout. Uh, that time there wasn't anything over on uh, university in the way of build of restaurants or anything. But that was back in 1918, 1920, and that. Uh, what were some of the student events you participated in? Well, my uh, participation in the student events was pretty well kept in the pharmacy department. Uh, I came to o OU with very little money, and uh, I had a job. I picked up a job uh, teaching pharmacy uh, at the end of my first year in pharmacy, or first uh, semester in pharmacy. The, I finished a freshman course in pharmacy in the first semester, and the next semester I taught it. And I uh, was lucky enough, fortunate enough, that uh, I made my way through university <laughs> teaching pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, at that time we had a, part of our uh, pharmacy was in the chemistry building. And part of it was in a little building back south and west of the chemistry building. And uh, the, the buildings on the campus at that time was a administration building, the educational building, the science building, which were two cross street uh, over from each other next to the, to the uh, administration building, the law barn, the chemistry barn, mm -hmm. and, and one building over in the uh, engineering. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the campus. Mm -hmm. Let's go into your medical, uh, medical school and then your medical career. Thank you. Uh, well, you you talked about d down there. Let's talk about your your uh, your medical schooling in Oklahoma City, and then your internship here. Well, the, uh, I had quite a time. I just, uh, I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to publish this, but it well, you better not say anything about you it. Better not say anything. <laughs> <laughs> now they wouldn't let me uh, get by with it, but you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're you're retired now. They can't they can't disbar you or dismiss you. So uh, things have changed. Then. Yeah, <laughs> my uh, my great friends that helped me a great deal was old Doctor Debar, Daddy Debar, who was head of the uh, chemistry department. Guy Wiley Williams wasn't exactly uh, a booster of mine, but 
we is kind of a funny situation. There was another youngster in pharmacy. He and I were great friends. DeBar took me under his wing, and anything I wanted DeBar would do for me. And that was unusual for DeBar. And uh, I used DeBar's private laboratory to do my chemistry. So uh, Guy Y. Williams didn't much like that, so he took my closest friend under his wing and turned his <laughs> laboratory over to him. <laughs> so we had quite a combination, <laughs> quite a com <laughs> complex uh, set up uh, there for two or three years. But DeBar was a, a great friend of mine. He was a wonderful guy. He was harsh in a lot of ways. A lot of people didn't like him. But uh, I just thought the world of him. And, and when you came he, up here, Mr. Dr. Turley was... Dean Turley was uh, head of the uh, medical, medical group down at uh, Norman in the medical uh, part. See, the first two years of medicine at that time were Norman. Dean Turley had. And Dean Who Turley. Who was your dean up here? Uh, dean Long, wasn't it? Uh, dean Long was mm -hmm. dean uh, until he, uh, he had to retire. He was dean a long time ago. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Turley was head of that two, the two years down there yeah. and along up here. Yeah. Of course, it's all up here now. Yeah. May I break in just a minute? Yeah. We came up here in about 20... Uh, seven I guess something like yeah. that and Dr. Hood at that time was working in the medical arts laboratory to help uh, to defray expenses and so forth and uh, there weren't too many girls who were working so it didn't occur to me to help out in that way in any way but uh, at that time there weren't very many married students like there are today that's very very different situation we were the exception not the rule <laughs> then uh, uh, now let's see, when you came up here, and Dean Long was the dean, uh, then we had to, Dr. Hood had to stop mm -hmm. uh, in your drug work and all, mm -hmm. and uh, because they did, you had to take your last two years mm -hmm. right together, so. Uh, well, I took about four years getting out the first two. Yes. And you then can't do that anymore. Uh, but uh, I was fortunate enough that to come along at a time when it could be done, and uh, so uh, I was a full-time professor in pharmacy and taking a full, and not full-time, but a half-time course, you might say, in well, medicine. Let's talk the about, article uh, here. Let's think about some of the highlights of the medical career. You might be able to help him along there, suggest some of the things that are most interesting in his career. Fred, do you want to tell them about working at visas and about filling prescriptions or do you want me to tell them well I can tell them all right, right. No, it, uh, I just want to remind you of it the uh, you know what you can't do that anymore but uh, it was two years there my first two years in pharmacy uh, in uh, medicine up I mean. here where he uh, wants to know up here well I'm, I'm talking about up here mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was pharmacist for St. Anthony Hospital. I was a pharmacist for Beasy's store on 10th and Classen. 10th and, uh, That's right. Yeah, 10th and Classen. And uh, besides that, I was pharmacist for the uh, School of Medicine. So uh, I held three jobs. It's the time I was taking my first two years in medicine. You can't do that anymore. They won't let you work at all, you know, anymore. But uh, in those days, it wasn't, you do whatever you could do. Well, I spent a lot of time, uh, missed time, as far as my wife and family were concerned. But we made it, didn't we, honey? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got by those, those two years. And then after those first two years, I, and I had to give up these things in order to, because I couldn't go ahead without it. Well, one of the things I think that uh, is so, was so wonderful for us, uh, after the, he had, uh, of course, he went to visas about seven every morning and opened up, and then the rest of the crew came on at eight when he went to school. Then he went back to visas at five and stayed until midnight because they, uh, 
drugstores were kept open on that late. But when that had to be given up, they sent um, uh, several of the sisters to Norman to school to take pharmacy so that they could fill their own prescriptions. But in the meantime, there was nobody there at the hospital to fill them. They'd been sending them out to drugstores. So while Dr. Hood was going to school and while he was interning, he was allowed to fill all the prescriptions for the hospital uh, while these two sisters were taking their training in, in Norman. So that came as a very great blessing. And uh, well, I was intern, officially an intern in the hospital, and I was also officially the pharmacist of the hospital. You can't, it couldn't be done anymore. The rules and regulations wouldn't let you when do it. When you started your private practice, where did you start after you got out of the Here in Oklahoma City. Uh, where did you practice? Part of Bill, where did you you mean the office? Yes. In the uh, Osler building. Osler building. Yeah. Why don't you uh, give a few of the highlights of your medical career? <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> well, the, the first few years you did all the. I did general practice. And. Go ahead. All in anesthetics yeah. for Doctor Long and Doctor Howard. Yeah. No, I uh, that was the thing that uh, was a lifesaver. Uh, I had given uh, anesthetics as an intern, uh, and uh, it got to the point where two of the doctors, the outstanding surgeons in the town, uh, insisted that I give their anesthetics whenever it was possible. And uh, so then when I got out on my own, why well, both of them, of course, started calling me for their anesthetics. and. Uh, I'm very fortunate the, I could do uh, other pra types of practice. The, pra the, in the uh, surgery was all morning. I kept my mornings free. And uh, old Dr. Howard, uh, when he said morning, that meant uh, anywhere from 6.30 to 7 at least, never later than 7 in the morning. So that uh, we had long, long mornings. And, but it gave me a chance to get in a pretty good day's work before noon. And uh, so I gave their anesthetics. I gave all of Howard's and most of Long's. Put it that way, wouldn't you, mm -hmm. honey? And uh, made a pretty good living out of it and mm -hmm. kept my wife and mm -hmm. baby and something to eat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here, didn't those remarks don't need to be. <laughs> then from there, uh, what, what have been some of the highlights that uh, I think possibly uh, you would say that uh, well, you kept along that uh, general practice until uh, you began to do some work in heart, and then when you went to the uh, into the army, you might. Uh, well, the thing when I when I got out while I was an intern, I decided that I wanted to be a heart specialist, and uh, I like general medicine. I didn't like surgery. The reason I didn't like surgery was on account of my eyes. See, I am only one eye. The eye I'm using is one that I couldn't use for 52 years. So that uh, I knew that I had no business doing in getting into surgery as a profession. My eyes wouldn't uh, take it, and I wouldn't be fair to the patients. Uh, so that. Uh, I shunned, although I would have liked surgery, I shunned the idea, stayed away from it, went into general medicine, where I wouldn't have those problems. And uh, so uh, I gave anesthetics for old Dr. Long, Dr. Right. Howard, pardon me? Well, let's see, I think he wanted you to talk about the cardiology part when yeah. you started that. Well, the cardiology, well, I actually started that as an intern, as uh, along that line. I realized that that was the thing that I was going to enjoy more. And uh, I did everything I could to keep pushing in that direction. And when I got out to uh, start with, my first thing of interest was to make enough money to take care of my wife and children uh, so that I did general practice. And as it built up and I could, I shifted away, kept shifting away until making uh, in uh, heart disease my 
main pro main Do you have any highlights of your career that you think might be worth mentioning? I think <laughs> one period you enjoyed you enjoyed, even though we were glad to come home, was our type of arm uh, time of army service oh, yes. in New Orleans. Um, army uh, went into the army. They uh, got my orders to report to uh, New Orleans for overseas duty. Well, I uh, was put into the General Hospital, Army Hospital there. Lagarde General. Lagarde, Lagarde General Hospital. And when I got there, I reported to the commander. Uh, he talked to me about well, what I'd been, how I'd been, uh, training and so forth and so on, my, what are my desires. And when I told him that I had been interested in cardiovascular diseases, I had taken special courses and study uh, in Oklahoma City and in Baltimore and, and uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia and Boston. Philadelphia and Boston. Now that uh, hit him right where he was needed, he said. So, uh, he stopped my going overseas, uh, not at my request, and in spite of the fact that I was all set and ready to go, and my family were ready for me to go, I, he blocked it, and I became assistant uh, uh, chief of medicine. And about two months later, I became chief of medicine, and that's where I spent the rest of my army career. But uh, he just. Uh, he just wouldn't let me go. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Hood, uh, during this period of general practice, would take off uh, three months, six months, or so forth at a time when, as, as money built up to where he could do it and go to Boston or uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia to take special courses. Then I think, Fred, when you came back, of course, you didn't get into anesthetics again. You gave no. yourself fuller to once, when I, once I got out of the army, I, I wouldn't give anesthetics. I restricted it to cardiovascular disease. That's right. Uh, one funny thing was that when Dr. Hood decided to stay with cardiovascular work, uh, doctors here in town and around the state that he knew told him that uh, that was a bad move to make, that he there weren't that many death. people <laughs> needing that kind of training and that he would starve to death. But uh, it worked out to be very fine and for us. And uh, also, there are a great many others there now all doing the same Oklahoma thing. Oklahoma City has grown so much more. Uh -huh. I mean, there's a need for so many now. Dr. Hood was the first man to limit his practice to cardiovascular in the state. Is that right? No, I hate his choice. It's Fred, you'll starve to death. Of course, this is an age of specialists today, mm -hmm. but they, this has come about really since World War II, hasn't it? Well, it really has. Yeah. Uh, I think except possibly for the surgeons, and now that is specialized, yeah. and for the bone yeah. people with yes. this. Uh -huh. that and the obstetricians. I keep looking at the uh, light because of Ms. Roberts. Uh, <laughs> she can't drive. The eyes remind me that she can't drive after night. So I want to. Uh, are there any other things that you think we haven't touched that we ought to mention? I suppose that we could go on here to midnight. But I'm sure you don't have the time, and I don't either. I, or you were asking sometime back about the uh, uh, mer uh, Statehood Day. Of course, yes. I don't remember Statehood Day. But I do remember I was living at Edmond after the First World War, and uh, my mother was up here that day in the city to a affair. Yes. So she called us, and we held the phone long distance there. We held the phone for about a half hour to hear all the whistles blowing mm -hmm. and all on our Mistress Day, which I think was, was one of my memories as a child. Do you have any other thoughts, Dr. Hood? Dr. Hood was in SAPC. Yes. I was, uh, I went through two world wars and never did uh, <laughs> really go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, to New Orleans. Well, New Orleans. And we all thought we should have a bat uh, battle ribbon for fighting the yes. battle of arms. Well, this has been a very interesting interview with Dr. and Mrs. Uh, Redding Hood in uh, Oklahoma City in uh, December the 8th of 1976.